as a tender, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it hath been written in the prophets, Behold, I sent forth my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, be making his path straight. There arose John, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance towards remission of sins. And all the land of Judea and of Jerusalem were going out to him, and all were being baptized in the Jordan River by him, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel hair and of leathern belt around his loins, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he was proclaiming, saying, The one who is mightier than I cometh after me, the strap of whose sandals I am not fit to stoop down and loosen. I indeed baptize you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time Jesus stood upon a level place and there was a crowd for his disciples and a great multitude of the people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. Even those who were troubled by unclean spirits, they were cured. And all the crowd was seeking to touch him for power was coming forth from him and healing all. And he lifted up his eyes to his disciples and began to say, Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye who hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye who weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye whenever men hate you, and whenever they separate you, and reproach you, and cast out your name as evil, on account of the Son of Man. Read your voice in that day, and leap for joy. For behold your reward, it is great in the heaven. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This festal period that the church experiences every year is bound up with several major feasts. The Nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christmas, which we celebrated last week or week before, and this week, which we celebrate the circumcision of our Lord, and later on this week, when we celebrate Theophany or the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ by John in the Jordan. And during this period, which lasts for two weeks or so, three weeks nearly, even the church declares that there is no fasting due to that period according to the greatness of the feast and the many things that are happening in it. The big emphasis that is put on this time, if you carefully listen to the readings and also the um, writings about these particular feasts, is the acknowledgement that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the second face of the Holy Trinity, came down and took upon himself the flesh of mankind, of creation. And to this day, as I often say to you, that becomes a stumbling block for many people, for they do not understand how God can do that and how he can become one of us in order that we may become somewhat like him through that grace. Several centuries ago, this idea started to ravish the believers, the Christian believers in the West. And in order to try and fix up some wrong ideas, they started to paint these paintings which you often see called Madonna and Child. You know, you've all seen them. And what do they do? They have um, usually some sort of person lady with a baby and they make sure that that baby is totally nude so that you can see that it is a male child because there was a problem in that during that time that they couldn't understand correctly about who Christ was the funny thing was that they often used models for that painting and they put them in their churches and whatever but of course to us that's not iconography you can't come and put that in your temple or whatever and pray before this picture of some model 400 years ago holding a nude baby, you see. 
It's, not, it's got nothing to do with the sort of iconography which we have in the Orthodox Church. They went to a great extent, and they went so far in the West, that they totally removed the spiritual essence of things. It all became fleshly, you know, beautiful flesh, and no spirituality at all. There has to be a balance, and that's why when you look at the Orthodox icons, you can see that not only do you see a person as such, but you see a, another world, another glimpse of something that you cannot capture here on earth. Something otherworldly, something spiritual about it, something that moves you to prayer, to um, contemplation, to stillness, to quietness, and to struggle against your own unworthiness in all of this. That's the big difference. Now, with this period that we're coming to, the baptism of our Lord, through that baptism, all the waters of the world have become sanctified, and the evil spirits that dwelt in them have been driven out. We, when we come into the Orthodox Church, usually as babies ourselves, are baptised in these same waters, the waters of baptism, which are sanctified beforehand and in which the child is immersed. And this becomes like a stamp upon that person's soul that they have entered into this church. It's like a stamp. They've joined the community of the church and they are expected to follow the ways of that church. Today, I see something that is very disturbing throughout the whole world. Even amongst those who apparently have been baptised. That they want to remove that stamp that has been uh, um, put upon them that they belong to God by another stamp. And what is this other stamp? You can easily see it. It comes in the forms of tattoos, um, piercings, and all these sorts of things. Believe it or not, when that sort of thing occurs and, you know, to a person who's been baptised, it's like they, they wipe out their previous alliance to God. And now they are joined to some other spirit. What is that spirit? Our Lord Jesus Christ says, that, or through the Apostle Paul, that all, 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 Gods of heathens are demons, antichrists, demons. So if you unjoin yourself from God, you must be joining yourself to someone who is against God, which is the demons of demonic realm. And you know, you look around and you see they put these horrible things upon their arms, their chest, their backsides, their legs, their necks. And have a look at them if you ever see them. There is nothing spiritual about that at all. It is very much a demonic picture. It looks dirty. When from afar it looks like you, you're covered in dirt. You want to wash it away. And these people mark themselves for life and pierce themselves. Ever since the beginning of history, this idea of piercing and of marking has always been the sign of a person under servitude, a slave. But a slave to whom? Who are they a slave to? Knowingly they go and make themselves slaves to Antichrist. You know that there's lots of talk nowadays about the coming of the time when we have to be accepting this mark upon our bodies, some sort of electronic mark that can um, be used to assess who we are, where we go, what we do, how we live, etc. People are now... Um, Voluntarily accepting these things. You could even buy a kit to do it yourself. So no, you don't have to line up in the queue of some government or organisation to be pierced and marked, but you can actually buy a kit and do it yourself. And people find great um, pleasure in this. It's like something good. You think about it. At the hour of your death, the... Testing angels come down to see who, to whom does this person belong. If they've been baptised and they're sitting there with piercings and tattoos, what are those angels going to say? Who, to whom does this person, person belong? They're taking into their grave the body which was sanctified through the Holy Spirit 
marked with belonging to somebody else. To somebody else. Who is that other somebody else? The fallen angels, the demonic powers, antichrist, and voluntarily at that. That's why you must be very careful. Any of you that have been into monasteries will know that one of the things that you don't see there are mirrors. Right? We don't see mirrors in monasteries. Why? Well, what does a monk or a nun want to do with a mi mirror? To look at themselves and groom themselves and put lipstick on or something like that, right? Or see how nice they look. They've died to the world. They've died to all of that. So they don't need mirrors. But we, in the world, we need a mirror in our homes. We need one. Not to check out how beautiful we are, but to see whether we are some sort of reflection of these saints that you see around yourself before you go out into society. Or whether you are marked with a tattoo or pierced with something, or you're wearing clothes which are not according to the way that these saints are closed. You know that? that? All these things are very important because our Lord Jesus Christ took on flesh, took on material matter, and that material matter has to be also raised to some sort of level of holiness. Today we see that people are quite happy to go walking in society basically in what amounts to underwear. That's what they're clothed in. Underwear, full of tattoos, piercings. And you look at that and you say, well, you know, to whom does that person belong? To whom are they issuing their prayer of their body and their soul? Certainly not to God. Certainly not to Christ. Not to the saints, which never did those sorts of things. And which actually mark the body for life. Because once you have a tattoo... Once you have a piercing, you can't undo it. It's marked for life, forever and ever. You take it to your grave. And there it stays. There is some understanding that when our Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead, with the new body, he still had the markings of the passion that he went through. The nails, the, the, um, where the spear went into his side. And therefore those markings went with him into the other world as a indication and reminder of what he went through. So these markings that we, or some people apply to themselves in the world, go into the other world with them. Because they are washing away the baptism that might have been given to them early in their life. Therefore you have to be understanding about these sorts of things that these tattooing and piercings and wrong dress are all things which are wrecking up your soul and your spiritual life and making you further and further and further away from that which our Lord Jesus Christ came to give us, that we become like Him in our lives, in our appearance, in our attitude, in our um, spirituality and in all aspects of our being. These are important things that we must keep in mind. And on this coming feast day, on Thursday, the baptism of our Lord, we relive that whole thing by taking blessed water and having it um, for us for the whole year, which you are supposed to drink every day before you have anything else. Some holy water and some antidoran from the um, liturgy of the week before. May you be strengthened in understanding this and pass on to your children and to others how wrong it is to misuse that material aspect of ourselves, let alone the spiritual aspects that we have. That you need to be careful how you um, conduct yourself and how you understand the idea before um, us which is bound up with the flesh and the spirit. That the two of them are important. The flesh is important and the spirit is important because of the resurrection. We are having to have both and they all have to be in accordance to that which our Lord Jesus Christ has given us. Amen. <coughs> Let us